All right, I want to welcome uh, everybody that's joining us online. Uh, we had a great time of uh, worship this morning, and uh, we want to welcome you uh, today. I, I, did, I shared it a little bit earlier with those that are here live, but uh, uh, Brian came down with a kind of a bad cold, something, uh, and called me this morning and uh, said that he was not going to be able to, to preach and uh, asked me to do the teaching. So we're a little bit uh, flying by the hip here, but uh, <laughs> anyway, I believe it'll, it'll be a good day. So anyway, we want to welcome you, though, uh, and uh, ask my bride here to pray for me okay. and pray for the message. Father, we do just come and bow before you, and just as Ken said, you're at the end of worship, that you are our living hope, and we're, Lord, we're so grateful. It's amazing how that is such a live word right now, that we definitely are so grateful for how you have put that in your word, and as we come before you today, we, we just really will pray that you would come and you would move upon Ken. Lord, just as we pray so many times that you would move not by power nor by might, but by the Spirit of God, that your river would flow, oh God. And we just thank you for those living words that you want to speak through him. And Lord, you know that this word is in him. And we just pray that you bring out what you want to bring out. Lord, he's made plans. But Lord, we pray that you will just come in whatever nuggets that you want to bring forth that you would speak through him and you would give it to him lord oh god we ask in jesus name and we cry out for all of us lord that you would truly give us eyes to see inwardly that we would see and we would hear in our inward man oh god and that this word would just really pierce our spirit lord god that it will be life because because it's really a timely word, and we just thank you for, for what you're going to do, and we just we just give praise to you that everything comes from you and through you and back to you, and we just say thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Yeah, Amen. What I want to do is I want to teach a message. Um, based on some stuff I've been studying, and, and the title I've given to it is Living as Daniel in Babylon. Living as Daniel uh, in Babylon. Uh, just give you a little bit of background uh, about it, and then we'll just kind of get into it, this in terms of a summary uh, form. Uh, back in the summer, I was, as I was working on uh, the, some of the teachings that I've done on the, on the bride, on the theology of the bride, a couple of messages that I did were based on Revelation 17 and 18 about come out of Babylon. Uh, you know, Re Revelation 18, 4 says, come out of her, my people, so you don't participate in her sins and receive her for plagues uh, and because Babylon will be judged. And so as I was uh, working on that in, the, in the, the theology of the bride, that the bride must come out of Babylon. The bride, there, there's no option to be a bride made ready and continue to live uh, in, in uh, spiritual or mystery Babylon that is arising uh, in, in our day. Uh, that the bride must come out of that system uh, in terms of its compromise. Uh, and for most of us, you know, wherever, whatever Babylon ends up being as it comes into full fruition, we're not really sure about, but as it comes in to that, um, into its fullness, most of us will not be able to actually physically leave Babylon. Uh, we're, we'll be living in it. But God is calling his church, the bride who will make herself ready, to be in Babylon, but not of Babylon. So that's the challenge that, that we're facing right now. The church is facing that right now. And, you know, we talked a, a good bit. There was a good bit of uh, prayer and worship this morning in the context of the struggles and the trials uh, that, all, that many of us, uh, really almost everyone in the room here, are battling. Now, I've realized that there are different degrees of that, but there are issues that all of us are facing. Uh, and I believe that 
these things are to prepare us to live a measure of vi- in a measure of victory uh, in the, the midst of a Babylonian system that is arising. Now, I'm not saying there's not the enemy involved in some way and, and maybe in many ways. There's, there's uh, and I don't really understand how, exactly how to uh, divide it, but I know God's doing some things in us and the enemy's at work as well. And we need to resist the enemy, but allow God to do what he wants to do. Uh, and so we're living in that context. Uh, and so there's, uh, what I want to do is try to set the context and come up with, uh, I've come up in the series that I'm going to be doing relating to that, because I've been working on uh, another series based on that bridal series that I started with called Living in ba- as Daniel in Babylon. And I've got like four, five, six, seven messages that I'll be doing at some point. But the, I want to just kind of tie into some of these things uh, today, several of the points. I've come up with 12 lifestyle choices that are really important for the bride to make in the context of what is happening in the earth uh, today. And it's, it is for today. It's not, uh, it's not something 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. It is happening uh, today. Uh, but in the context of that, uh, The Lord has had me study like three different books. One, the book of Daniel, because of some of the things that he and his friends went through in terms of resisting Babylon. Uh, The Revelation 17 and 18 about the rise of mystery Babylon, uh, Babylon the Great, the great harlot that is arising in our day. Uh, The book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah began to prophesy to Judah, the southern kingdom, which ultimately went into Babylonian captivity, he began to prophesy to them a number of years, maybe 20 or so years before that, where even during the time of Josiah, when there were, where there were reforms done, but then uh, following that, the kings uh, began to turn away from God The priests turned away from God, and Jeremiah was a prophet speaking, come back to God, come back to God. Yet at the same time, knowing that wasn't going to happen, knowing that Jerusalem and the people there were going to go into Babylonian captivity. So the Lord's had me study all those things. In 1 Peter as well, the book of 1 Peter, where Peter's message in 1 Peter is to prepare uh, to live Uh, in difficult times and the suffering that might come from that due to persecution that is that is coming Uh, and so in that context uh, um, this verse of scripture this is what I want to kind of make a theme Uh, we'll go into a lot of details here but first Peter uh, chapter 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. And the phrase I really want you to see is that Jesus Christ is our living hope. And in, in the days that, that are coming, in the days that, are, that may be shortly coming, but in the days that are coming, Jesus Christ will be our living hope. And po- quite possibly, the only real true hope will be Jesus. All the other stuff may fade away, and we're going to need Christ. We're going to need him, and we have to learn to live much like Daniel and his friends did uh, when they were in Babylon. We must learn to live that way uh, because as we do that, we'll be focused on Christ who is our living hope uh, for victory, uh, eternal victory for sure, but even victory uh, in this hour. Uh, So anyway, that's the theme uh, that I want to talk about. I want to set the stage a little bit. Uh, and then I want to talk 
uh, about a few points from the book of Daniel about how he, be he began to live because these are the things that we need to begin to focus our life on if we haven't already, to live as Daniel uh, in Babylon. Babylon is rising uh, in our day. Uh, most likely, I mean, you know, uh, when we look at Revelation 17 and 18, it is a mystery, and God is beginning to unveil it, but there's still quite a mystery involved in, in Revelation 17 uh, and 18 about mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great, the great harlot that is arising. But it seems like to me, and I think Brian would agree with this, is that, you know, if you look at Revelation 17, it talks about uh, the seven kingdoms and then the eighth. And uh, the six, first six of our, our historical, six was the Roman Empire that was there when John wrote the book of Revelation. But the seventh was following that. We believe that it's still in the future. Uh, and there's an eighth, which is the Antichrist kingdom, which will come out of that seventh one. And you can see it, you can read it right there in Revelation 17. But what we sense is that the seventh kingdom uh, is rising right now. It is, it is the mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great. And out of that, as that kingdom arises into fullness, whenever and however that turns out, then the Antichrist will take over that kingdom, and that will be the eighth kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom that we know about. Here's the point. We believe, and I, I, I feel very confident of this, that the seventh kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, is ri arising throughout the earth right now. We're not looking at something that's going to happen 20, 30, 40 years from now. It's arising right now in the earth. And the Lord is saying in Revelation 18, 4, he's saying, come out of this system. Come out of it. Don't participate in this system because there's, there's sins involved with it and there are plagues involved with it. And so he says, come out of it so you don't participate in the sins of Babylon the Great and you don't receive the plagues of that. And like I said a minute ago, you know, most of us are not going to actually physically be able to leave this system, but we're going to be, we're going to be forced, if we want to walk in purity with God, we're going to be forced to come out of it uh, in order to live uh, separate from it without, while even living uh, in it. Uh, and so this system is on the rise now. There's, there's four aspects to it that we need to come out of it. There is a, there is a governmental, and you can, read all, you, know, you can read all this in Revelation 17 and 18, there's a governmental, political aspect to it. You know, we see that uh, Revelation 17, 18 says it's a city, that Babylon is a city. Revelation 17, 1 says that it's on many waters. Uh, and Revelation 17, 15 says that the many waters are peoples and nations and tongues. So this, Babel, this mystery Babylon that is arising in our day the intent of it is to be a global, political, governmental type of, uh, of uh, entity that will control the lives of every person uh, in the earth. That is the, that is the intent. Now, you know, other places, you've real, you realize that we, we, we need to try to resist that and become a sheep nation rather than a goat nation. But the intent of the mystery of Babylon is to take control uh, uh, of the earth. And I realize as I'm saying all this, that this is kind of like Thanksgiving with John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, sorry about that, but this is the only message I got, so you get stuck with it. <laughs> no. But, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, we, we've obviously talked to a lot of the guys in Africa a lot, and, I was talking to Moses, who's one of our leaders in uh, Kenya, uh, and he was saying that, you know, they are coming up now in Kenya with a digital ID uh, form for every uh, citizen of Kenya, and they will do a, uh, a um, recognition, digital recognition based on the eye. 
so that they can track and coordinate all of the things that are going on there. So the whole world's not escaping this movement. Uh, you know, this, we had kind of a joke uh, this morning. Uh, Chris was showing me the thermostat, how to work the thermostat. I, I have uh, thermo uh, modern thermostat syndrome, anxiety syndrome, I think. Because I, I, like, we were like in the mountains um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they had those thermostats. You know, when I see a thermostat that's round like that with the buttons, I mean the button and all that, I panic. Because anyway, we were up there, and our thermostat in the cabin was like that. You know, you'd come in, you'd go out in the middle of the day, and you come back in the evening, and it's like 50 degrees. It's cold that week. You know, it just fit like 50 degrees. And so then you push it, try to adjust it, and you get all this message like, you know, that it's going to be a, you know, you can set this thermostat, this temperature, and all that. And so I have that syndrome, but then Chris was saying, yeah, this, this one, we can connect to the Internet. You can get an app where when you walk in the room, walk in the building, it automatically turns on the heat. And I thought, okay. I mean, it's good, but he's like, hey, Antichrist, here we are. We're here meeting. <laughs> you know, because it ties in globally. Who knows, who knows where it's going? Uh, try to lighten it up a little bit here. But who, who knows where, where, where it's going? I, I don't know. But there's a, globe, there's a political governmental system that's trying to control every aspect of your life. Now, there's also a religious aspect uh, of this as well. Uh, you just see that in Revelation chapter 18. There's a religious aspect to it uh, as well. This trying to uh, emasculate true Christianity and incorporate it into some sort of a system. And it's still a mystery as to exactly how that's going to unfold. Some think it's the uniting of the three monotheistic religions of the earth, and that could very well be. Others think that it could be uh, based on uh, climate change and issues like that where you have to incorporate your beliefs into a system like that. Others think it's a system that would incorporate the acceptance of uh, perverted issues that we would not agree with. I, I, who knows where it is, but, but the point that we do know is that true biblical Christianity is going to be challenged in the day. Uh, in cha challenge. What, what has happened here to my... Uh, huh? It's good? It's on? Okay. All right. Uh, that was the Antichrist trying to turn off my microphone. <laughs> we, lo we love YouTube. YouTube, you're good. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I forgot where it was. Okay, but anyway, there's going to be a challenge to biblical Christianity in terms of religion. Uh, and then the third aspect is economic. You see that in Revelation 18 uh, as well. There's an economic aspect to it, and you, you know you see th you hear about certain things that are being planned about a digital currency, global di digital currency controlled by the central banks, and all of those things. Uh, again, we don't know how any of that's going to ultimately unfold, but there's definitely a movement toward the economic control of every aspect of our life. And then there's a fourth aspect of it. Those are the three aspects that we need to come out of allegiance to. We can't, we can't be in allegiance with the system when it comes against our walk with God economically, governmentally, politically, or religiously. But there's a sinful aspect of it as well. We see that in Revelation 18, verse 4, where it says, Come out of her, my people. And then there's a quote from Isaiah 47 right there. Isaiah 47 is the chapter about, Come down, O virgin daughter of Babylon, about the queen of heaven and all the tentacles of the queen of heaven. Come out of all that, which would be, you know, issues like sexual uh, sin, sexual perversion, witchcraft, false religion, you know, on and on uh, and on. So the Lord is saying to his church, I believe right now, these things are on the rise. The seventh kingdom hasn't fully come to, into being yet. But these things are on the rise. But now is the time 
that we need, you, the church needs to come out of these things, separate from allegiance and participation in all of these things so as to be able to walk in the living hope of Christ uh, in this hour. Uh, and to do that, uh, an example of that, a way of, of illustration, I believe uh, uh, an important one, is to live as Daniel did when he lived in Babylon. Uh, so anyway, so that's the kind of the background. Let's go now to the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 1. Um, I, have, I have came up with 12 lifestyle choices but I, to, to, as Daniel and his friends lived in, but I'm not going to go all through all those, so don't worry about that, but we'll touch on a few of them. Uh, let's read a little bit of the first chapter of Daniel. Again, we're looking at the way we have to live uh, using Daniel as an illustration, the way we have to live in the context of the mystery Babylon that is rising in our day. I mean, just a little bit of the history of Daniel. I think you probably know that, this, but Daniel lived in Jerusalem, and uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, uh, he uh, attacked uh, Jerusalem and took uh, many of the Jews into captivity. There were multiple sieges, but Daniel and his three, his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, went in that first siege in about 605 or so uh, B.C. So he was living in Babylon, but he didn't compromise with the Babylonian system. So let's look at, uh, let, let's look at a little bit on the first chapter. Let me read a little bit of it. Uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. He took some, he took some of the vessels of the temple uh, into Babylon, and he brought them into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. So he brought the vessels from the true house of, of true house of God into his, uh, the temple of his false gods, Marduk and uh, the other uh, gods that they worshiped in Babylon. Then the king ordered Aphenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring son of the, some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and the nobles. The chief of his officials is what it says in the New American Standard, but that's really... Uh, most likely, the chief of the eunuchs. Uh, and so probably, although there's not absolute evidence, probably when Daniel and his friends were taken into Babylon, they were made eunuchs. Um, now, that in itself is not an exciting uh, uh, possibility, but there's a spiritual application to that as to where, what Babylon would try to do to his, God's people. Uh, so, uh, youths in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court, he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans, and the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. And he appointed that they should be educated three years, <clears throat> at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were the sons of Judah, Daniel, Heniah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm sure I'm not passing these right. <clears throat> then he, the commander of the officials of the eunuchs assigned new names to them and to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hanias, Shadrach, and to Meshach, and to Aswet Abednego. Now, again, I'm butchering the names. But you look at, there's like four things that, are, that this Babylon tried to do to the, to the people, to Daniel. But these are the same types of things that Mystery Babylon is trying to do to us, trying to do to the people, the Christians and the people of the world. One, to emasculate them into the system, to emasculate their, their 
standing firm in their own beliefs and to incorporate or emasculate them so that they will come into this system. Uh, and there's a, there's a real intent to do that through information, through, uh, you know, just different issues that the media, the governments, and the, everyone is doing to emasculate in the system. The same thing is happening today. Uh, the second aspect of what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do, they, was trying, they were trying to get Daniel and his friends to compromise truth, compromise their stand on truth. Now, it was the dietary laws, you know, they wanted him to, to eat of the king's food and all of that. But to do that, Daniel and his friends had to compromise the scriptures, which had the dietary laws in them. And that's what's happening today. Compromise truth. You know, I'm not going to pick a particular thing, but there's many different issues that the, the scriptures speak clearly about, but the global system, the press, the media, the governments are saying, you know, this is not, and even the part of the church, even the Pope's coming along with a lot of that. This is the, uh, this is not something that we need to stand on, this issue, even though the scriptures are very, very clear about it. And so that's another aspect that's happening right now before our eyes is that they're trying to compromise our stand on truth. The third thing is that they're trying to change our identity, our, our, our change our identity of a biblical Christian uh, that is standing on the word of God and standing for Christ and Christ alone. Uh, you know, he said that, uh, and I'll, I'll use Daniel as the example. He says he changed Daniel's name to Bel to Shazar. Now, Bel was one of the main gods of Babylon. If you look at Isaiah 47, you see the queen of heaven but if you look at Isaiah 46, you see Bell. So what was he doing? He was trying to incorporate, he was trying to change his identity to identify with the Babylonian God rather than the one true God. And that's, again, that's happening right now through, through information, through knowledge, through just all the, just through the education system, university system, all of that to, to influence with knowledge, but to change the identity of the people where they don't stand separate from this compromised system and stand for God, but incorporate them all into it. I mean, we see, we see that, uh, you know, just a couple of issues right now we see is we see the, the whole anti-Semitism uh, issue that is ri arising all over the world. I mean, who would have thought we would have the kind of uh, protests against the Jews that are taking place really around the world, but even in America, even at the, you know, college campuses and all of that. They're incorporating, they're, they're trying to incorporate and, and change the identity of people so we don't stand for Christ, we don't stand with our Jewish brothers. Uh, and then, you know, he was also trying to fill them with knowledge and understanding. You know, three years of, tr uh, of indoctrination into the, into the things of Babylon. Now, that's, that's happening as well. School systems, especially the university systems and the media and all the things you hear are just pouring out issues that try uh, to incorporate people into the Babylonian uh, system. Uh, it's all for the purpose, uh, you know, it says in Daniel chapter 1, so they'll be useful in the king's service. Uh, that's what they want to do and, and incorporate the, the people of God into the king's service, uh, into, into this system so that they can be useful in the king's service and not come against, uh, and not come against the compromise that is coming forth uh, in the earth. Now that, unfortunately, is happening right now in the world. 
Do you agree? I mean, do you, it's happening in the, in the world right now. Uh, and the Lord wants us to resist it. Um, let, me, let me go on to Daniel 1, just a little bit more. We're starting with verse 8. Let's read a, uh, another, just one more verse. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not uh, defile himself. Uh, it's made up his mind or set upon his heart or resolved. He resolved in his heart, I'm not going to compromise. Now, he talked about the food and all that, but it's all of the things, you know, that he wasn't going to compromise. Uh, and that's, we'll get to that in a minute, but that's going to be one of the points. We have to, comp we have to resolve in our heart that we're not going to, we're not going to incorporate or uh, come into this system. We're going to stand against it. And now's the time to make those kind of decisions, not, not in the pressure when, you know, there's a lion's den or a fiery furnace in front of us to make it. Make them now. Uh, make the decision in your heart now. Now, one of the things you see, one of the things that we see with Daniel is that the testing of his, he and his friends and for us, for the church, was progressive in nature. You know, in this first test, the king uh, wanted to incorporate, incorporate him into the system. He, didn't, he resolved he wasn't going to do it, but he asked permission. You know, he said, uh, you know, ask permission of the head of the units. Hey, can I, we try this other thing. And, the, and it worked out. And, you know, and he was able to, to live that way and he was accepted. Uh, and there was no, per, no per, uh, persecution or any effort, anything there. He, he, he asked for permission and was granted that kind <coughs> of permission. But the, the testing increased as you go through Daniel. You know, to get to Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were asked to bow down and worship the idol of King Nebuchadnezzar. And they said no, and they were put into the fiery furnace because of that. But they refused. And, of course, God delivered them in the fire. But there was, it was from asking for permission to, hey, if you don't bow down to this system, you're going to go into the fiery furnace. That was the second thing. And then by the time of Daniel in the lion's den, it was like, hey, we can't really get Daniel. He doesn't, he won't compromise. The only thing we can get him on is if we make a law, if we make a rule that hey, you have to bow down to this system or otherwise we're going to throw you in the lion's den. And of course, Daniel didn't and they threw him in the lion's den and again, God delivered them. But you see the progression. You know, even going back to Jeremiah before they went into captivity, he began to speak prophetically, prophetically, prophetically. Uh, come back to God, come back to God. Get out of your compromise. Come to God. Cut, turn back to God. But they wouldn't listen. The kings didn't listen, which is a picture of the government. The kings didn't listen, and the priests didn't listen, and the people didn't listen. You see, the, the kings, the priests, and the congregation, none of them listened to the, uh, to the challenge uh, that Jeremiah, the prophet, the leading prophet of the day, was making. Uh, and so they went into captivity. And then even then, the progressive nature of the judgments. And so my, I mean, I know this is not like a, hey, hallelujah message, but I, but I really believe it's important for us to understand these things and deal with them now. Uh, we, we really need to deal because these things are progressively going to get worse, in my opinion, as I wait upon the Lord. And we need to deal with these things right now. Uh, so anyway, there's 12 of these. Now, I'm not going to go through uh, 12. Uh, I'll go through 
just a few of them maybe. Lifestyle choices that come, uh, found them. here we are, that come, the first one is to give the Holy Spirit complete permission to purify us from sin and compromise of all sorts. That's really an important issue right now, right now. To, you know, ask and give the Holy Spirit complete permission to purify us, purify our hearts, purify our lifestyle. You know, this, I, I want to just share this illustration, but it's, it's not about the people I'm going to share about, it's about us. You, you're, we're all familiar with the, the issues that are going on at IHOP, Kansas City. You're familiar with the, uh, you know, what's happening, and and I'm not, I'm not making a point, one way or the other. I mean, probably like every one of us, we all have an opinion on issues, but that's not the issue right now. It's not the what, whether there's guilt, or innocent right now for us. The issue is this, I believe, that pertains to what we need to do personally more than anything else. Because if you, if you will recall, uh, Terry Bennett, when he was, well, go back, not when he was at our church, that's another point. Terry Bennett in 2021, the Lord had an encounter with the Lord I don't remember the exact details of it, but essentially the encounter was the Lord saying to him, if you give me the vessel, I will bring this age to the end and Christ will return. You, and you, I probably, most of you probably remember that. You give me the vessel. Now the vessel he's talking about is the forerunner vessel, the John the Baptist vessel, the messengers, the master builders, those that will be a voice into the global church and say, come out of the compromise, just like Jeremiah in a sense, come out, of, come out of compromise, come out of that and come back to God, focus on Christ, focus on making a people ready uh, for him to make the bride ready rather than every other thing that's being spoken about in much of the church. If you give me that vessel, I'll bring it to an end. And IHOP is the most well-known, prominent. I'm not making a judgment one way or the other on who's the best vessel. But there, I mean, if you had to say who's the most known global vessel, forerunner vessel, it would be IHOP. And here's what I believe God is doing. And I'm not making a judgment one way or the other on, on the issues of IHOP. But I do believe this is what's happening. God is purifying right now that vessel. He's purifying the vessel. Because if the vessel's not pure, it cannot be a voice into the church. The first step of this global vessel coming forth is that this vessel itself must be pure, must be as much as possible free from sin, free from compromise. And so there is a work of the Holy Spirit, I believe, that has been initiated, maybe first uh, with IHOP, to purify the vessel, wherever that leads. I have no idea. But the challenge of it, because we're part of that vessel, the global vessel, you know, we're, we're do, working with Africa. We're working with the Forerunner School. We're working with each other. And so the challenge is me. I've been, more than anything, this whole issue has put the fear of God in me. Lord God, I know I'm functioning as a messenger to, especially to Africa, uh, you know, we got a conference coming up with the leaders there. And it's put the fear of God in me. Lord, deal with me whatever that you need to deal with me on. Because I want to be 
you, you know, I, I want to be a pure vessel. And I think that would be wise for each and every one of us in this hour is to ask the Lord uh, th those issues in our own life. You know, going back to 1 Peter, um, didn't have this ready where it exactly is, but verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But like the Holy One who called you, you shall be holy as I am holy. And so he said, be sober. Gird your mind. Prepare your heart. Prepare your mind uh, to, to purify, to be holy as he is holy. So that's the first one. Daniel resolved in his heart that he was not going to compromise. And, uh, and out of that, uh, for us, give the Holy Spirit complete permission to purify from sin and compromise of all sorts. Can I hear an amen on that? I know this is, a, this is a, I know this is a really a heavy Thanksgiving message, but blame it on Brian. I didn't get, you know, I wasn't planning on doing this. He got, uh, he got sick, not me. So uh, <laughs> hopefully not me anyway. Um, number two, build your own personal relationship with Christ that is not dependent on externals. Yeah. It's really, really important. Uh, you know, when Daniel was in, Jerusalem. I mean, there's there's no real record of his worship practices in Jerusalem, but you can just imagine. I mean, you know, with the kind of walk he had, he probably was involved in the temple worship. You know, the part of the sacrificial system, and there was a lot of activity, a lot of external activity in the religious system there. But when but when he was taken into Babylon. There was none of that. There was no temple. There was no sacrificial system. There was none of the externals. It was just him and God. And, of course, he had his friends, and we'll get to that point in a minute. But it was, it was basically Daniel and his God. And that's where we need to get, lead our relationship, where it's me and Christ. Now, I, now that isn't, I'm going to get to a point of corporate worship and, and, and those things and community in a minute. But there's so many people in the body of Christ who are seeking God, but they're looking, oh, this guy over here had this word, this guy over here had this word, this guy had this, this message here. That. Now, and I'm not, I'm not against any of that. That's okay. But it cannot be a substitute for our personal relationship with Christ. Because if all this stuff is taken away, there is not going to be, who knows how much of that will we even have access to. So we need now to develop our work, personal relationship with Christ. Very, very important that we do that. Uh, and that's a challenge for all of us. And I know we're at different seasons of life, different issues. Time is a major issue for a lot of, a lot of us in different ways. But the point, and I know God is able to make, it's very creative in terms of how to allow us to do those things. But it's very important that our relationship is not built on externals. It's built on a personal relationship with Christ. Amen. 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 All right, that's number two. I only have 25 more to go. <laughs> um, number three, build community with like minded believers. Build community with like minded believers. Now, he did, Daniel did have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So it wasn't, you know, I mean, I imagine uh, if, you know, to go to the chief of the eunuchs and say, hey, can we uh, not eat this king's rich food? Can we eat vegetables and all that type of thing? Uh, it would be a lot easier if four of them went over there than just one, you know. 
it'd be a lot easier just to say, hey, the four of us would really like to have permission. Uh, and so that's important, that, and that is important. And, and community is going to be probably even more important. So in one sense, it's got to just be me and God, or you and God. But in the other sense, we need each other. We need, we need the community of faith together, true community of, of relationship with each other because it's going to be dependent. I, I mean, the challenges that we might face, uh, who knows where they win and where, but they might become so difficult that we need, the, uh, you know, a group of people around us of like-minded believers uh, that, we can, that we can follow and that we can walk with. Okay, that's number three. Uh, I'll go through a couple more, man. Um, resol- number four, resolve in your heart that you will not compromise with the Antichrist system. Um, we, we talked about that a little bit a few minutes ago. But it's really important that we make that decision now that I'm not going to compromise with, with this system. And, and I want to put a caveat there. When it calls me to walk um, to compromise my faith in order to be a part of the system. Because if you look at, uh, this is the fifth point, uh, and I'll t- talk about these together. Cooperate with the system in those areas which do not violate your faith or conscience. So, you know, I mean, Daniel was not really a rebellious person in the system. You know, he went to the king and interpreted the dreams. He, he did, you know, what could be done. Uh, Peter talks about this uh, in First Peter. You know, he, you know, you have to you have to read it to get all the details of it. But uh, you know, because Peter was talking about uh, the persecution, the suffering that's coming uh, as a result of persecution, and the and the fact we need to put our hope in Christ. But but in that he says, but even there, submit to the th- those in authority. Uh, submit in marriage relationships, submit in employing relationships. So it, the, the context is we're not to be a rebellious people and, you know, not submit in any way. But the question becomes, you know, when, when something is, lead, is, is opposed to Christ or leading to that, we need to really have discernment on what to submit to and what not. Because Daniel resolved in his heart that he was not going to compromise with the system. And it put him into some pretty tight situations. You know, the lion's den being one of them. And, uh, so hopefully none of us will go into a lion's den. Uh, you know, I mean, would you... Would you rather, do you ever play that would you rather game? Would you, would you rather get eaten by an alligator or get thrown off a cliff or something like that? Our kids used to play that, you know. Would you rather get cast into a lion's den or a fiery furnace? Which would you rather? Uh, we would rather not do either one, you know, would be the answer. But uh, if it happens, we need to, so we need to resolve now. Because one, at one point, uh, I don't. Uh, this is later on. I wasn't going to talk about this one, but I'll mention it. You know, the, the, there's a baptism of fire that is coming. This is getting heavier and heavier, I know. But it's a baptism of fire that is coming in the earth to the church, and it's necessary. It's necessary to make the bride ready. Um, y'all are all going to leave before I finish here. <laughs> the silence is deafening. Okay. It, it, it's the baptism. There's a baptism of fire that's coming to the church. Um, but it's, it's a fire purifies like nothing else. You know, Peter, again, 1 Peter is an excellent book along these lines. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. You know, some think that was because when Nero, 
you know, the Rome burned and Nero blamed it on the Christians, and that's when persecution came. But there's a baptism of fire uh, that I believe is coming. Hopefully it won't be too hard. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not wanting any of this, and I know you don't either. But we need to be prepared if it comes not to compromise because the whole goal of the enemy with this whole system is to get people to fall away from Christ, fall away from devotion to Christ so that we, uh, you know, you know, Jesus and the apostles talked, to, Paul talked a lot about this. It's going to be a great falling away and I believe it's going to be associated with this whole stuff that's coming in the earth. Uh, and so we need to resolve in our hearts uh, not to compromise. I tell you what, I think that's enough of the heavy stuff. Let me end with one more point here. Um, from back to First Peter, we read this at the beginning. Verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this we greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Now, here, here's the point. I want to end with this, this point. Jesus is a living hope. You know, he's a hope that no matter how hard issues get in the future, no matter how fast they come, he is the living hope. He is our hope. And I, I think I need to, to share this one point related to maybe some of the things that are coming. You know, I mean, Jeremiah spoke to the people in that day prophetically. And, you know, there are, there are many prophets in the earth. Um, the one that I tend to listen to the most is Terry Bennett who comes to our church uh, but I'm not I'm saying there's not others that we listen to or gain from and I don't want to put him on a pedestal but you know he did have the encounter one about the vessel but then also the encounter that the first two seals have been broken the Antichrist system being released and the, the red horse, which is taking peace from the earth. And, you know, we've seen both begin to play out. I mean, peace from the earth, I mean, you know, I mean, didn't take a rocket science to, just to know that, you know, Jerusalem and the Middle East, Russia and Ukraine, the, you know, just all of it. And it's not just, not just war, but, I mean, it's just peace uh, from the earth. Uh, and so this system is, is unfolding. Uh, how rapidly? Who knows? Um, but this is the point I want to make. I really I want you to listen. When he was at our church, this is September 8th through 10th, this last couple months ago, you know, his, one of his themes was remember the Remus. Remember that? Remember the Remus. And he drew it from Second Peter. Uh, but the point he was making, I mean, he made uh, quite a number of points, but the point he was making, and I think, he, I think it's important to us to understand that he made it at our church. So when he's speaking at our church, yes, he has a global audience that he's speaking to, but there's also a, a dynamic of him speaking specifically to the church that he is here, here with. And he was saying, he, he was making the point and now he was general, but if you read between the lines, you can see it. He was making the point. He says, not everybody has an encounter with Gabriel. Not everybody 
you know, Gabriel came to one and that one spoke to the many. And so that, that's, that's a biblical principle. And so he was saying, remember, remember the encounters. And I think in a sense of that, he's speaking to us, remember what God is saying in this hour. And he said, be ready, be ready, be ready. And so he's calling us in this hour to live for Christ in the midst of whatever might come. You know, to, to begin to live like Daniel, to let him purify us, see Christ in our relationship with him, do all these things. And then to this final point of going back to living hope, to trust that in the midst of whatever is happening and whatever might happen in the future, Christ, Jesus, is our hope. But it's not just, it's not just a, a dead book. It's alive. It's alive. Principles of here are alive. And, and they speak of this man, Christ Jesus, who is our living hope. And if, our, and if we're sick, our hope is that he is Jehovah Rapha. If we have financial lack, our hope is that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. If we're in turmoil with family relationships, our hope is that he is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. If we need direction, he, our hope is that he is Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. He is all these things. And, and, you know, what Peter was saying more than anything is hope that even for a little while, maybe there's going to be difficulty coming in the earth and we have to endure through that. But there's a hope of eternity. Life is short, eternity is long. And we live for Christ. And the eternal hope. But my, my experience over the years, it's got, I mean, it's interesting that uh, into this year, Donna and I will have been in full-time ministry now for 40 years, the end of this year. And over those 40 years, you know, I've set my hope on him in eternity. But there have been so many times that I've, I've asked him with hope, with, with confidence of who he is, not necessarily confidence that he's going to work in my situation, but confidence in who he is, that he's provided for me. I mean, unbelievably, miraculously at times. That he's healed me, uh, again, miraculously at times. That he's led us on just this journey through trial and tribulation and good times and bad times. and just, So he is a living hope. I, we set our hope on, on eternity, on him and the promises, but he is also the hope for for survival and protection and uh, sufficiency in the midst of what might come in the midst of that. Yes, Daniel put his hope in God, but he also trusted him in the lion's den. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they trusted him as God, but they trusted him in the fire. I believe God is able. I believe he will. But if not, I'm going to continue to worship him. And I think that's where we need to be. So let's place that. Let's... De let's allow God to go deep in our hearts right now um, and trust him and believe that he is our hope. He is our hope. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, we just ask that you would help us all to live as Daniel lived. 
in Babylon, to trust you as a living hope, to deal, let you deal with us and we deal with you in whatever is needed in this coming days. We ask for that and pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen.